Um, today's class will talk about how when markets don't quite have competition, um, they can get poorer outcomes for society. Um, and this is in some sense distinct from um, our earlier a discussion in introductory economics of the distinction between competition and monopolies. So we know that a perfectly competitive market um, is one where there are no further gains from trade once um, markets have allocated uh, resources. Whereas with, mo with monopolies, um, a monopolist will restrict quantity and increase the price compared to the competitive outcome. Um, and so this creates uh, what we call deadweight losses or inefficiencies in that context. Um, market power or monopolistic uh, features of the market are already a very good problem for us to engage with. And good governments or good um, institutions around markets will ensure that um, these, th th that market power is limited as much as possible. But there's a deeper problem when competition is restricted. Um, and we'll talk about that today. And it's not just in the context of um, uh, competitive markets, but in other contexts, as we'll see shortly. Um, to start though, we have to define what economic rent is. Economic rent is um, any amount of money that you earn over and above the amount that you have to be paid in order to be incentivized to do something. In other words, um, let's say that to do something, to be indifferent to either doing something or not to do that thing, you have to be paid, let's say, 100 rupees. Any money that you earn over and above that 100 is considered economic rent. So this is a similar uh, concept to profits to super normal profits. Um, so when we say that in any context, an actor, an economic actor is earning economic rents, that means that they're doing, that they're earning more than they need to earn. There are scenarios in which economic rent is perfectly reasonable. So for example, if you're an inventor and you have invented a new item, um, you get a patent for that item and then if you're earning more money than you needed um, to provide the item, that is reward for your hard work and your research and so on. Um, if you write a book, similarly, you get a, a copyright on the book. What you need to be paid in order to sell the marginal copy of the book is actually quite little, but the amount that you earn over and above that, the economic rent that you earn there in the short term is payment for um, the effort that it took to write the book. There are also scenarios in which economic rent accrues through luck or through unsystematic sort of just situational scenarios that arise. And we have to use judgment in thinking about whether we want to worry about economic rent all in all contexts or in at all times or not. Typically though, when we think of economic rent as economists, we're thinking about scenarios in which um, there is systematic rent. That is, there are systematic features of the economy, of the market system, or of the government regulations of markets that causes some people to earn more than they need. And this is what we'll talk about today. We're going to discuss two papers. Um, the one is the perhaps the first known description of this idea of not just economic rent, but rent seeking, which is a concept I'll come to in a second. And the second is the more famous uh, treatment and slightly more complex. Um, we'll discuss these papers, first the simpler one to create basic concepts, and then the slightly more complex one to create more a deeper intuition for you. Um, and then follow this up with a uh, sort of a general conclusion to the, to the class 
um, where we will try and piece together how the idea of economic rent and rent seeking fits in uh, into our broader discussion. So this paper by Gordon Tullock didn't actually use the term rent seeking um, and it was the contribution of the next author that, that we'll get to that gave us these terms, um, but very much the concept. So Gordon Tullock said, let's say that we take your usual um, uh, sort of chart with quantity on the x-axis and uh, money on the y-axis. And suppose that there's the, an international price P0 uh, at which we can buy an item from the international market. Um, there is a domestic demand curve that we have. And if we have a scenario of free trade, even if the domestic production cost is higher, we will consume from the international market uh, at this blue point um, at quantity Q0 and we will get consumer surplus equal to this blue shaded triangle region. Now, if on the other hand, we have prohibitive tariffs, that is um, the tariff on imports are so high that after you add that amount to the international price P0, they rise above P1. That is the tariff is more than P1 minus P0, that difference there. If you have prohibitive tariffs, now suddenly there is no uh, international um, item being imported and you will have domestic production at this orange point, the restriction Q1. Consumer surplus is immediately decreased. And then traditionally um, we count as dead weight loss this shaded region. Um, and we have to think about what becomes of this orange area. So in those traditional calculations, now suppose that we, instead of having a domestic production cost uh, P1, um, domestic producers can produce at price P0, but are showing to the government that their cost is actually P1. So they are overstating the cost of production. In this case, by, um, by making that argument and by asking for um, an import uh, restriction uh, or rather uh, prohibitive tariffs, they can get the quantity Q1 because they're charging the price P1, but actually their cost was just P0. And so for the units up to Q1, they earn extra profits of P1 minus P0. So um, typically when we do deadweight loss calculations, um, deadweight loss calculations are calculations that um, describe the potential gains from further trade that are not being harnessed because we lacked, um, let's say, uh, we, we lacked the ability to trade because of some institutional reason. Um, this triangle, which is called Harberger's triangle, was typically used or, or identified as the main cost of import restriction or of market restriction. All other changes, as we can see, are transfers. So um, remember that from that original larger blue triangle that we had, we now have a smaller blue triangle, that's the consumer surplus. And the rectangle amount uh, Q1 times the difference between P1 and P0, that rectangle there, um, that was a, a profit that um, producers were now earning at the expense of consumers. So it was a transfer from one portion of your local economy to another portion of your local economy. So Warren Talek said that if the transfers that we're trying to get, that is the transfer of this rectangular box from consumers to producers. If that is attained through political investments or rent seeking that ensure the move from a free trade regime to a prohibitive tariff regime, 
that this amount can be wasted and debt bit losses are higher. And the intuition is that people are generally willing to expend up to the amount that is up for grabs. So as an example, think about a currency note. Um, if I pull out a currency note and I say, I ask the class to bid on it, then if you're a rational bidder, you will increase the bid amount by at least whatever the increment is, one rupee or 10 rupees, whatever. Um, so let's say that I have a 5,000 rupee note. Now this 5,000 rupee note, I say the entire class can bid as many times as you want um, until we have no further bids and the note sells. And if you're not colluding between yourselves, which is unlikely perhaps, but let's assume that you're not colluding, colluding between yourselves. If you now uh, start bidding and you're, let's say I have a 5,000 rupee note, the first bid is a thousand rupees. That is, I will give this note to, to, to the winner, uh, to the person who made that bid, if no one else makes a bid. And so this person makes 5,000, which is what I gave him, minus the 1,000 that he or she gives me. So they're making a profit of 4,000. If you figure this out, you're going to say, well, no, I'm going to bid 2,000, 3,000, and so on and so forth. At 4,990 rupees bid, you're still making a 10 rupee profit. And so bids will continue until the last possible increment. And I end up not making a loss. In other words, when there is an amount that you had available to you that you could bid on, um, you were willing to expend as much as the amount itself. Now, if we have a rule that we can create that will give you 5,000 rupees worth of benefit, the intuition of rent seeking is that you will be willing to spend up to 5,000 in order to get that. But there's something more problematic about this, which is that that economic rent is not being received due to an increase in production, but because of a transfer of money from one party to another party. So um, this is uh, the, the basic intuition. And again, we'll uh, talk about this uh, in more detail in the next paper, which is Ann Kruger's and uh, sort of paper that followed a few uh, years after Tulloch, um, titled The Political Economy of the Rent Seeking Society. And so Kruger is the person who then popularized the notion, but also explained it in a slightly more complex way. So, um, Here's the quick intuition of that. Now suppose that instead of a, a prohibitive tariff, we have an import restriction equal to Q1. We get the same graph basically, but instead of having a prohibitive tariff, we have import restriction. Now, if import is restricted, that means only a certain amount of import is possible. Let's say that that import requires a license. That will mean that anyone who gets the license and is able to import will get per unit P1 minus P0 profit, where P0 is the price that they um, received the item from the international market at, and P1 is the amount that they sell it for. Um, so we already know that import restriction causes deadweight losses. Um, the black and white striped triangle here uh, was the deadweight loss. It causes administrative costs in that, that those licenses have to be issued. There have to be officers sitting who are, um, whose job it is to allocate resources and may dissipate rents. This amount that <clears throat> the importer is earning, they are potentially willing to expend money to get this a piece of this action. And so there are various forms that this rent seeking can take um, and doesn't always have to be corrupt. So for example, um, if the quantity of the good that you're getting, let's say that you're, uh, you're importing an intermediate good. Let's say that you're a repackager, you're going to import the item, 
you're going to in bulk you're going to um, make small packets and you're going to distribute this is very common in pakistan so you should be quite familiar with it um, if the quantity of the intermediate good that you're being going to be allocated depends on your productive capacity depends on let's say your packaging um, set up and how how much you can package firms have an incentive to create even more capacity and let's say that the country al already has as much packaging um, infrastructure as it requires but every firm will get more license to import if it has greater productive capacity then people will be adding productive capacity even when the total import is fixed let's say the government says you're only allowed to we will allow producers or importers to import a maximum amount of let's say 100 units of this item that you're going to repackage and you already have in this country in various places some people already have the ability to uh, package that 100 that those 100 units but the rule is anyone with packaging ability will get a proportion of uh, the 100 units that are going to be imported according to the proportion of the packaging capacity that they have so in that case they will and because these initial packages are earning supernormal profits or economic rent more people might be um, incentivized to come into the packaging sector and set up and so we might have excess capacity more capacity than we needed to do the work we will, will effect, in effect be wasting that amount um, and the reason that we are creating that waste is that it creates distributional benefits to us privately it allows us to take some allocation from existing players and take it for ourselves um, and it allows us to then earn profits on that amount um, so we'll have more than the efficient number of firms operating at less than efficient size now we've said so far that government officials are allocating um, the right to import this profitable item um, first they've created the restriction that creates market power for whoever gets the license and now they're issuing these licenses we've said that those licenses are being issued uh, in proportion to your productive capacity but suppose that in fact they're not really caring about the productive capacity as much as the amount of bribe that you're giving them then you could have corruption in rent seeking and people will compete on the size of the bribe that they're willing to give to the government official to get the license or they might decide to create political power that forces the bureaucrat to give them the license or it might be that the bureaucrat finds someone related to them and gives the license to them so classic nepotism or suppose the bureaucrats are perfectly non-corrupt and honest but they're more likely to give a license if you show up to their office and so what will happen is that firms might compete on situating their offices near the government office or hiring workers whose job it is to go and market uh, their firm to the bureaucrat these are things that shouldn't really matter your um, you know efficiency does not require you to be well networked with the bureaucrat even an honest bureaucrat but this would be a this would be a way of rent seeking so we're going to do a simplified um, model of rent seeking and what i'm going to do actually do is these slides uh, were originally for a more complex class but i'm going to um, try and keep i'm going to skip through a few things i've already simplified the slides down um, and what you need to know at the end of the day for this class is not so much the specific math but the broad intuition and i'm going to try and give you rather than just the dry equations i'm going to try and tell a story and so even if you follow along the story carefully 
um, that should be sufficient. Um, the math isn't a necessary part of the course. Of course, if you understand the math, your intuition is probably going to be a bit stronger. So with that preface or caution, let's look at this. Kruger's paper divided her model into these five portions. First, just the basic situation, the basic model, then what happens in free trade, and then what happens in import restriction without rent seeking, and then import restriction with rent seeking. She then goes on to measure the welfare loss from rent seeking, but we will probably skip once we get further into the paper. So let's start. Um, imagine that there are two goods. The first good is domestically produced and exported. Right? So you produce it at home and you export it and we'll assume that to be food or in this case, let's say wheat. And then there's just one consumption good, which is imported TVs. So you have uh, you, you can only produce food at home and send it out. And the only thing that you can import are TVs. And the other thing that is required for conversion from your local produce to imports is that there are people whose job it is to purchase from the agriculture sector, the raw wheat, export it. Um, and then use the proceeds from exporting to import goods that are then sold, import TVs that are then sold. So, and the only factor of production in the economy is labor. So we have people who can produce wheat without any implements required, and they can export it to buy TVs that they bring back. It's a small economy that can't affect its terms of trade. And we pick units such that the international prices for both goods are one. Now, let me explain a couple of these things. First, uh, imagine that this economy is located on a remote island okay, and that the island's port is a few days walk away from the only inhabited village where you do the farming. So there are people who are farming on the island and then there are people whose job it is to take from the uh, farmer but the farmer can't just go and buy TVs directly because it's a long walk. And so we're going to uh, take that walk. Uh, we're going to have people whose job it is to take that walk. Now, the other question to ask is, how can the price of one unit of wheat equal the price of one TV? Um, and the answer is simple. Um, think, about, think about this for a second. A wheat bag versus a TV have very different prices. How can you make their prices equal? Um, the way to do that is that we define one unit of wheat by varying the quantity. So if you start piling on wheat bags against this nice new TV, there will be a certain number of wheat bags that are expensive enough to be equal in worth to the TV. So in general, for any two items that are divisible, you can figure out quantities. Uh, as long as you can figure out quantities, you will be able to get uh, one price where the price tag on this thing is equal to the price tag on that other thing. And so for simplicity, we assume that, um, that that's possible. So um, the basic model starts as follows. There's, an, there's a simple agricultural production function where the amount of wheat that you can produce depends on the amount of labor that is employed in that area, in that sector. That is the number of farmers that you have. And the amount of wheat produced increases at a diminishing rate. This is your standard production function. Nothing complicated here, I think. Now, the level of distribution output D is equal to the level of TV imports M. And I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by this in a second. One unit of distribution entails exchanging one unit of TV for wheat with the agriculture sector at domestic terms of trade and exporting the wheat in exchange for TVs at the international terms of trade. What does this mean? It means that 
your distribution sector workers or who I call porters will buy wheat at home at whatever price uh, you can buy wheat at home for take that amount of wheat go through the walk to the port and sell it to the ship that's at the port the price of uh, TVs that you'll get um, at your at the port you, you get and then you um, bring the TV back sell it for more wheat and the cycle continues so um, let's go further um, there are constant returns to scale and distribution in other words these are porters and we'll assume that everyone is perfectly healthy and equally healthy equally sized and whatever so one person if you're talking about small TVs one person can carry X number of TVs and if you're talking about large TVs um, Y number of workers are required to carry a TV okay so one unit of distribution requires K units of labor um, in other words if you're going to buy if you're going to sell one TV um, um, let's say it's a large TV and K equals maybe four you need four people to carry this TV back um, then the number of laborers required to distribute with people who I'll call porters is equal to four times the number of TVs which is one in this case so LD that is the number of porters um, employed in distribution equals K times the number of TVs D if you have small TVs you will have um, let's say there are 30 TVs in total that we have to bring in and K is one third one person can carry three TVs then the total number of laborers required is 10 so LD equals K times D K can be more than one if there is a large TV and more people are required to carry a single TV or K can be a fraction that is one less than one person might be required to carry a single TV um, but regardless if you need more TVs you need more workers in the same proportion unlike in farming where we said that there are diminishing returns to um, to labor there are constant returns to labor in porting the distribution charges PD uh, per unit is added to the international price of imports to get the domestic price of imports PM so we have assumed that the rate at which we transact wheat for TVs at the port is one one unit of wheat whatever you're defining that uh, one man or one bori or one container one unit of wheat equals one TV at the port when they bring that back to the village they're not going to sell that at the amount that they bought it for because they have to make their own earning so they'll add their amount which we are calling PD to get the local price PM so the distribution charge is PD um, next society is demand for TVs that is the total number of TVs that you're going to de demand depends on the domestic price of TVs that is PM and the total income generated in agriculture so to understand this think of it this way let's say that there is a one variation of this island could be where we are very close to the port so it's only one day's trek which means that the amount that we have to pay the porter is less then we might want lots of TVs because we're getting it at a relatively good price versus an island where it's like a 10 day trek from the port to the village and obviously you'll make that trip less times it's going to be costly to make that trip and when a TV comes back to the village it's a very dear product because it's required a lot of labor to bring back and naturally if it's very expensive it, there will be less demand for it so M which is the demand for TVs depends on the price M 
um, the domestic price of TV is PM, which is equal to 1 plus PD. And it also depends on your total income generated in agriculture. If you have an island where there is a lot of production of wheat, your income from agriculture is higher, you're going to demand more TVs. If you have a, an island where uh, production quality is weaker, you have less money to spend, obviously you'll import TVs less. So that's this equation number five. Um, and we are assuming this is more detail perhaps than you need, but that all citizens, farmers, distributors and rent seekers who we'll introduce in a bit uh, have the same consumption behavior. Then domestic wheat consumption is simply quantity that isn't exported. So your total um, your total production is A minus the amount that you send away in order to buy TVs and that amount is your total consumption at home which is F. So we are assuming that the economy has fixed labor supply that means that the total number of people there are engaged either in LA agriculture, LD distribution or LR rent seeking. In other words People can either be farmers, porters, or rent seekers, and nothing else. Now that's a fairly simple uh, thing to understand, I think. So the first, so far we've just described this island and what can happen. Um, but what happens under different rules um, of economic operation? So with a free market, uh, with free trade, I'm not going to ask you to go through all of these equations. If you want, you can pause or go to the actual paper, which I've reproduced uh, in very faithfully here. But um, you don't need to know all of this math, but you need to know the concepts. The first thing to know is the idea that competition equates your agriculture and distribution wages. And this is a core idea of that you should intuitively understand about the economy also. If there are no barriers to entry into work of any sort, the work, the wages that you can get from different types of work should differ only to the amount of um, difference in difficulty of the work. But that's a general point. Specifically here, um, your wages in agriculture, that is what a farmer makes must equal what a porter makes. If it's not equal, then either the farmer will be tempted to become a porter or the porter will be tempted to become a farmer. So what are these what are these wages and what do they look like? Well, for farmers, it's simple. Um, the first derivative of the production function, A dash, is the marginal productivity in agriculture, and that equals wages. That has to, so that's the wages of the farmer. What are the wages of the porter? The wages of the porter are the amount that you earned per TV rather, right? So remember, we bought the TV for one, we sold it at PM, and the profit that we made per TV was PD. So the profit that we made per TV was PD, and we have to distribute that profit amongst everyone who, um, who carried the TV. So if there were four people carrying the TV, K equals four, the wage that that porter makes is equal to PD over K. And if one person was carrying three TVs, K is one third, then your wages are PD over one third or three times PD. So you're getting the profit for PD in its entirety for all three TVs that you carried back. So that should be fairly intuitive. I hope you understand A dash equals PD over K uh, by now. Of course, when there's free trade, there's no rent seeking. So LR equals zero. And uh, we can skip most of the rest of this for now. I think I can get you the intuition without going through this math or this. So, okay. Let's, so let's look at this figure. We have wheat or food uh, in Kruger's description on the x-axis and TVs or imports M in Kruger's description on the y-axis. So, so F hat, M hat is this curve that you see. Um, that 
curve f hat m hat is the consumption possibility frontier um, that is you can produce a total you can only produce on the x-axis you can only decide how much food to produce um, and depending on how much you produce you will be able to send some away and convert that into tvs but this is uh, the why is the curve f hat m hat curved like this well, let's take f hat at f hat there are no imports so there are no porters right? um, with zero imports you, no one is wasted on not wasted but spent on being a porter everyone is a farmer and so we all create food and we consume that food um, if the distribution were costless, consumption would be chosen from F hat A. Now, suppose that this island didn't have this sort of treacherous walk to the port. The port was right next to the farms. So then when the ship comes over and says, I need 10 bories of wheat for one TV or whatever, one unit of wheat for one TV, that's the price. The farmer can just go sell the food, get the TV. And so the uh, 45 degree mi minus sloped line describes that relationship that you can costlessly convert your food into TVs and so your consumption possibility frontier lies between F and A. If though we go back to this idea that um, the porters are uh, required that there's some treacherous walk that you have to make or even a simpler walk but a long walk that you have to make from the port to the, the village um, consuming one more unit of import requires exchanging one unit of food but also requires taking away k units of workers from agriculture to be used in distribution aap kehte hain ke mujhe ek aur tv chahiye to us tv ke khatir aap one unit of wheat denge plus aap utne bande bhijwayenge jitne ki zarurat hai to bring back that tv and those guys cannot be working on the farm anymore and so the more that you shift away from um, producing wheat to consuming tvs the less people you have left to work on the farm now remember that we have diminishing marginal product of labor in agriculture this means that the cost of additional imports in terms of foregone food production rises so i give the following example for this remember that diminishing marginal product of labor applies to everyone not just to the last person who comes in if we had 10 farmers and an 11th comes over everyone's marginal product productivity falls but for simplicity and for intuition let's assume that every farmer everyone is equally good at porting porting is donkey work literally and so everyone can be a porter but let's say farming is a skilled job and let's for simplicity say that there are 10 total workers in the economy so if we line them up we can line them up from the most um, sort of skillful farmer to the least skillful farmer when you decide to go from being a community of farmers only and no porting to starting to buy TVs being judicious requires that you give up the least skillful farmer first but so you send that first person who's really bad at his job as a farmer to be a porter and he's doing a perfectly good job you can carry the TV back as good as well as anyone else. He just wasn't well skilled, but he was perfectly good at carrying the TV. Now, you gave up that one person, but that one person wasn't very skillful and wasn't really contributing much to farming. So their going away matters, but matters very little because they weren't doing much. Next time you need to free up a porter from the farm, you're going to go to the next weakest farmer and maybe that person wasn't adding too much also was adding a little bit more output than the first guy but not much and so on and so forth as you consume more tvs you have to take away increasingly valuable workers from farming 
That think of that intuition in a slightly more abstract way. Marginal pro productivity is has more to do with the number of people employed. We are assuming that their quality is the same, but as in, in a scenario where there was diminishing marginal product of labor in agriculture, that is, the more people you add to farming, the less productive they are in farming. Going in the reverse, adding more imports, taking away porters from the farm means that you're now going from uh, giving up very little extra wheat production when the first porters went away to giving up a lot of um, wheat production when your more valuable workers go away. So diminishing marginal product of labor means that the cost of additional imports in terms of foregone food production rises. And on this graph, that means that instead of the straight line FA, as you move away from consuming all the food you produced to wanting more TVs, you're going to have to give up more and more food um, lost because you had to spend people or ex use people in porting instead. Um, and so that gives you the curvature F hat, M hat that you see here. <clears throat> Therefore, price of distribution and hence domestic price of imports increases in moving northwest from F hat. At consumption point M hat, okay, M hat, as you can see, um, I've put a small orange dot there. At consumption hat point M hat, OB food has been exchanged for OM hat imports. Remember that um, at the port, the price is one. So if you want to buy back O M T Vs, you have to give them O B worth of wheat. Um, F hat B is the agricultural output foregone. That is, this orange gap is the agricultural output foregone to distribute O M hat imports. Earlier, we were able to produce F hat. When we are consuming only TVs and no food, we to buy OM hat TVs, we need to give them OB wheat, which we did. But why are we only producing OB and not OF hat is because all of these guys who've had to go away to bring back TVs would have added BF hat, this gap, F hat B, um, additional output that we've decided not to um, create. Um, and so if you put society's indifference curve uh, II, you can get maybe C is optimal. And at C, um, well, we can forget about the prices here for a second. Not really something I want to get into, but at C, OG food um, would be produced with EG equals EC exported. Okay. Um, sorry, I've put that like this, right? So if you're going to consume at the point C, that means you're going to consume uh, CE amount of TVs. And to always get that much TV, uh, you have to give up. You put a minus one slope there and you just get the, uh, you, you understand um, how many, how much food you have to give up, which is EG in this case. OE is your domestic consumption. Remember, it's point C. That means you're consuming OE food and consuming EC TVs. So OE, the green stuff, the green line is wheat produced that you're consuming at home. EG is wheat produced that you're sending away. So total wheat production is OG. And this F hat G is again, the amount of production that could have happened if they were, if everyone who was a porter was freed up to produce wheat. Um, we've talked about what happened. We've talked about this description of this island with TVs and wheat. We've talked about what happens with free trade. Now what happens without when you have import restriction without rent seeking. So we're saying now that who gets to be a porter is exogenously determined. Hmm. Um, so you have an import restriction um, M hat because the number of TVs that you can import is limited 
the competitive wage equality no longer holds. We said earlier that your wage rate for farmers has to equal your wage rate for porters. But when you have a restriction on the number of TVs that you can bring in, your TVs are relatively scarce in society. And that means that um, you're going to have a few things happening. First, the number of porters that are required to bring back a limited number of TVs is less. So your number of porters is decreasing and your number of laborers in farming will increase. That means that your, and we've also, because there's a um, uh, import restriction in place, the number of TVs in, in the economy is relatively less and the number of, um, the amount of food output that we're producing is relatively more. Um, and this means that you're going to have TV is becoming scarcer and food becoming more abundant in the economy. And so the relative prices will uh, change in the favor of TVs. If TV is becoming more expensive because people are willing to give up more and more of an abundant, um, um, abundant um, good, which is wheat, in order to get scarcer goods, which are TVs. Um, also, as those porters that were freed up going to becoming farmers again, the marginal product of labor in farming falls and the farming wage rate falls. So two things are happening here. One is that the number of uh, TVs is scarce, which means that if you bring back a TV, there'll be uh, demand is higher than supply now. And so your price will go up for TVs. And remember what you earn as a porter is PD over K. So your wage as a porter goes up. On the other side, the wage of a farmer is A dash and that has fallen because there are more farmers there and the marginal product in farming is lower. So that equality A dash equals PD over K um, sees a disturbance on both sides. What farmers earn is now becoming less and what um, uh, porters earn is becoming more. When you have um, one sector of the economy earning more and another sector of the economy earning less per worker, you would normally see a move from that less earning sector to the more earning sector. But remember, we've ha we have a barrier to entry here. And so we can't have that reallocation back. This means that whoever is lucky enough to remain a porter, remember the total number of porters will also fall because the number of TVs is falling. We don't need as many people there. And if the government is randomly picking out who gets to be a porter, the lucky few who, who do end up being porters are actually doing well. So they will earn economic rent. They're earning more money than they needed to make in order to remain porters. Um, but this is rent without rent seeking. They're not doing, doing anything to earn that rent, except just being the lucky few who end up staying porters while the total porting industry shrinks. And uh, that excess labor drives down the wage rate in farming. Okay. Um, so we can show, uh, we can skip the graph on this, but um, if you go back to the paper, you will see that um, you have more food output, obviously, because farmers were freed up. Uh, there are more people who have no choice but to be farmers. So food output goes up. Domestic food consumption goes up because um, food is cheaper and TVs are dearer. And um, the domestic price of TVs and um, distribution rises and whenever you create um, a restriction on quantity of any in any market when you create barriers to consumption or production in general you will see a welfare loss um, if people were optimizing their consumption and production before and now you've created a restriction you're making them do constrained optimization and so they're uh, generally going to do less well. And this can be seen on the graph uh, in figure two on the. Now, so far, the government was just randomly picking who gets to be a porter. But now let's think about a scenario where there is competitive rent seeking. Who gets to be a porter is competed upon. And this can take various forms, but I'll explain in a second. 
if the import restriction um, remains, but for, but who gets to be a porter is decided not by um, by random allocation or by the government mandate, but by people being able to do something to get that access to being porters. Maybe they can stand in a line. Maybe they get to bribe the government or who, whatever else. If they can spend energy in doing this, now more people who are farmers will be attracted to try to be porters. The simplest way to think about this is just a line. Forget about bribes for a second. If you're, um, uh, let's say, if you're a farmer, if in the morning you wake up, you decide, do I want to go and work at the farm or do I want to go stand in the line and try to be a porter? And if you're in that line, when the bureaucrat comes in, they pick someone at random, let's say. Or they pick someone, depending on who is standing first in the line, whatever it is. But once you go and stand in that line, um, you your day is wasted. Let's say that the government office to uh, decide who gets to be a porter is at the port. So you wake up in the morning, you decide, do I stay in the, on, on the farm and work here? Or do I actually walk out to the port? Um, where I will be allocated as a porter or not. You are now making a choice um, that is random. And so people will start seeking those rents in porting. Um, and this will continue. People will flow into trying to be potentially potential porters, trying to be part of the distribution system until the average wage of a farmer or, or rather the the wage of a farmer the known wage of a farmer or the fixed wage of a farmer equals the average wage of being a porter or being someone who was trying to be a porter but came back empty-handed right you wake, woke up in the morning either you're a farmer or you're a rent seeker or porter seeker let's say trying to be a porter you go to the port authority sometimes you get picked as a porter you earn extra profits sometimes you come back empty-handed the probability in expectation the average probability of becoming a porter must be such that you are that when you wake up in the morning every day you as a worker on this island are indifferent between going to the farm or going to the port so what has to equate is A dash, the agricultural wage, which we've talked about before. This has to equal, now this looks a little complicated, but it's very, very simple actually. Earlier this was equal to PD, the amount that you earn per TV over K, the number of workers required to bring back the TV. If there are four workers bringing back the TV, they each get PD over K. That's what we were going with earlier. Now, what a porter, potential porter earns um, is as follows. First, how many people go to try to be porters? The total number of people who try to go, who, who go to try to be porters equals the total number of porters plus the total number of people who went and came back empty-handed. That is LD porters plus LR rent seekers. And M hat is the total number of TVs being imported. So the total revenue in porting is total TVs imported M hat times PD, which is the profit, let's say per TV. That revenue has to be distributed amongst um, porters. So we'd say LD, but instead we're saying LD plus LR because whether you get a piece of that pie or not is randomly allocated. So some days you come back having earned PD M hat over LD, which is much higher than A dash. And some days you come back having earned nothing because you were one of those people who were part of the LR, the people who went to the port to try and get the uh, license to import uh, in Tullock's words or uh, to, who, who went and tried to get um, a TV to bring back and you failed, you came back empty-handed. So A dash equals 
pd times um, m hat that is the total revenue in tvs over total number of people who went ld plus lr um, um, well let's skip the rest of this not really important for you here and we're assuming risk, neut risk neutrality of course otherwise everyone would want to be a farmer if what you can earn is equal um, what happens to the solution for import restriction without rent seeking when rent seeking is introduced the first thing we've said by assumption is that m equals m hat so the number of tvs that we were importing before is the number of tvs we're still importing which means that ld the number of porters that you require is unchanged so the only labor entering rent seeking must come from agriculture it makes sense um, which means that as you go from restricted porting rest restricted um, access to this economic rent that you've created as you go from that scenario to a scenario that allows rent seeking where you allow people to go and stand in line and try to be porters productive resources resources that were being used um, on the farm well who were, who were producing wheat on the farm have now gone away from the farm and become and, and gone to stand in line even though we already had enough people we, these people have gone to stand in line because they want to get that extra profit and this means that your agriculture production actually goes down but your amount of tvs imported doesn't change so your total consumption as an economy decreases under rent seeking rent seeking entails welfare loss beyond import restriction beyond the deadweight loss of import restriction um, without rent seeking and we can show a graph of this um, we'll see a further decrease in the consumption possibility um, when you have rent seeking um, okay i'm going to skip a few other things now let's start generalizing and talking about why this story is uh, important to the study of market so first remember that the value of rents reflects the value of domestic factors of production that could be extracted from the economy with no change in the final goods and services for society economic rent is where someone is earning more than they needed to so if we took that money away from them they'd still continue doing the work they'd still give us the goods and services we want and that money would go to be spent on someone else so economic rent um, is um, in some sense a waste um, and so if you think about this example that we've talked about uh, in Kruger's paper you can see that if you have import restriction without rent seeking in other words if the government says you will import that person makes a extra profit compared to your farmer so there's an inequality to import restriction anyway but there's no waste of workers who are trying to go and seek rent um, and this has a nice analog in the corruption literature where the idea is that if you have a very corrupt person who controls every part of government or every allocation that gets made that the total damage done is actually less then if you have a lot of small players each competing to uh, be corrupt but that's just a small sort of i guess anecdote for you for now um, but the idea is that rent seeking this idea of chasing after uh, these potential profits is wasteful um, going back to this example of your quotas if you're expending effort in trying to get that get your company a share of that quota um, many firms employ so-called public sector specialists or government specialists whose job it is to be well connected with government and to convince the government through various means uh, potentially some of them honest some of them not to um, give the allocation or the quota amount to their firm 
they're not productive in the sense that they're not adding to the number of goods and services being produced. They're not changing the amount of total imports for the economy. These are resources, rent seekers, um, just like the, the guy who would be a wannabe porter, who, who would be a porter, but came back empty handed, rent seeking in its various forms uh, creates a negative value, creates a loss for the economy as a whole. So we want to create an economy where rent seeking is decreased. The problem is that economic rent is a great vehicle for corruption. When you have free markets, firms are earning normal profits. There's no justification for them to give a bribe to be in one sector versus another. They're also not, they don't have heavy sort of fat pockets from which they can give those bribes. If a corrupt ruler decides to create import restrictions, individual firms will chase after the profits, the artificially created profits in that environment. So if you go back to the graph at the start of class, just by virtue of creating that import restriction, you've created profits for that firm. Those profits are simply transfers from consumer surplus to that producer. Importers or rent seekers will chase after whatever rent has been created in the society by regulation. And to chase after that, they will be willing to offer bribes to that corrupt leader. What are the implications of rent seeking for the study of markets? So you should create this intuition of looking for whether or not any economic actor is earning more than they really need to be in that sector. Um, economic rent typically occurs when a free flow of goods and services is restricted. And as I said in the start of class, there are legitimate reasons why you might want to have some economic rent, such as, for example, um, uh, patents or copyrights, but you really want to interrogate those ideas and think about whether um, it isn't an excuse for creating artificial artificial profits for these individuals that they can that create the possibility of um, corruption. Economic rent typically accompanies debt weight loss, and effort and resources are dissipated seeking rent. Uh, that could rather have been spent on something useful. So to end, um, I would steer you to um, read this great book that's been out for a few years now, Why Nations Fail, by two of the most important economists alive today, Deron Asimoglu and James Robinson. And I'm just going to give you a quick quote. Um, so. In this book, what they argue is that there are two types of uh, institutions. There are inclusive institutions and extractive in institutions. Inclusive institutions are ones where a large number of people across the economy can, uh, can partake, can benefit from whatever circumstance has been created. Secure property rights are a great form of an inclusive institution. The more secure property rights are, the more people can uh, engage in economic activity around those, around that property. And extractive institutions are ones that create these type of benefits for some parts of the economy at the expense of other parts of the economy. So to quote um, one passage, they say that to be inclusive, economic institutions must feature secure private property, an unbiased system of law, and a provision of public services that provides a level playing field in which people can exchange and contract. So a lot of the themes that we've said in class are echoed in this book, and that this should be not just for the elite, but for a broad cross section of society. They must also permit the entry of new businesses and allow people to choose their careers. I think the, this passage is a good uh, sort of 
summary of many of the themes that we've talked about in this class. You want to have property rights, you want to have security of life also and contract. Um, and beyond that, you want to allow free entry and exit of people from uh, sectors and businesses. In other words, you don't want to create the type of import restriction that we've talked about today. They also say that this in then enables the growth of two other engines of prosperity that have historically been identified as technology and education. Um, so I think this is a good, nice summary uh, to end at. You want to always keep in your mental back pocket this question of, is the scenario that I'm dealing with one where there are barriers to entry and exit, where there's a level playing field, or are there advantages or disadvantages that are being um, deter determined, uh, that are being adjudicated on by potentially government officials or by rules that can be uh, manipulated. Um, a good market economy, a good economic, the, a good economic management of the economy requires the recognition that uh, when working well, markets create both immense value and create opportunity um, that people can partake in. The efficiency that free markets um, create are not created automatically. They require the institutions of um, law enforcement, of property right enforcement, of contractual enforcement, among many other things. They also sort of are um, diminished or markets also go awry or become dysfunctional when there are externalities, either positive or negative. And then there's another role, <clears throat> there's another argument for um, potentially for government intervention. And we want to, as a rule of thumb, always think about uh, competition and information in markets. Um, so with that, we're done. Thank you very much for listening. Take care.